Good morning, dear Sangha. <laughs> um, today is the second last day of do- for those of us who come for one week. Tomorrow, some of us will go home. But today is also a normal day for the rest of us. Those of us who stay here or stay longer, it's another normal day. Mm. Today is a little bit uh, foggy and cloudy. So um, this morning, in the early morning, it's not very clear to see things. It's quite uh, misty also. Now it's a little, getting a little bit better. But when the sun comes out, everything looks brighter, right? It looks brighter. It's, it's like a high definition uh, picture. Very sharpness. Very sharp to see everything. Um, but we don't know when the sun will come out. <laughs> Sometime in the afternoon, and sometime not at all. But there's one thing that we can always invite. It comes out. It is our mindfulness. When we are not mindful, we see things very blurry. It's just like the, the surrounding this morning, very blurry and not clear at all. So when we uh, invite our energy of mindfulness to come out, we can see things very clear. And uh, the, sur- then the surrounding is very bright. So for those of us who come here for a week, we have a chance to uh, slow down, to rest, to stop, To refresh, to rejuvenate, and tomorrow, whether we are ready or not, we have to go home. <laughs> so, but one thing we can always keep in mind that the energy of mindfulness is within us, and we can always invite that energy to to manifest. So that we can be aware of ourselves, we can be aware of the people around us and the environment around us. In the moment of distress or stressful, if we remember to come back to our breathing and breathe mindfully, then we have time to think clearer and to make better decisions. So we don't have to make the decision right away when we are not clear, when we are not calm. Uh, many of us, when we come here, we have a lot of doubts, we have a lot of anxiety, we have a lot of fear. So the way we live, the way we ask the question, it's, it, it's really show um, how much we very um, unsure about ourselves, about our relationship, about our professional life. Um, so this morning we will learn one sutra of the Buddha. Uh, this sutra, the Buddha taught the big quote to contemplate every day. And not only the bhikkhu, but also the bhikkhuni. And then he also said, for lay men and lay women, you can also practice this sutra. So we invite a sound uh, room to uh, show it on the screen, because it's on the board, it's very small for people in the back to look.
I came back to Lower Hamlet after 10 years being away. I first came to Lower Hamlet uh, in the year 2000. At that time, I was a little bit younger. <laughs> Full of energy and ideas. I have a lot of ideas about monastic community. but also full of ignorance and arrogance. Uh, I have a college degree that is good enough for me to make a living, but I was not very aware of my potential, by, of my strength, but also of my habit energies. And I was very arrogant. <laughs> Um, in terms of learning, in terms of uh, following the guidelines and the, and the teaching. But now, look back, I see 18 years has flashed by. When I first came, I used to hear Thay said, well, 10 years is just like a blink of your eyes. You know, to a person of 20 or 30 years old, it won't click. <laughs> it did not click at all to me. But now, after 18 years, I truly experience what I said. 10 years is really a blink of your eyes. Time is really flying very, very fast. So we have this sutra. It can also call uh, the five remembrances. This has been translated and is in our chanting book. And it's called the five remembrances. But it's come from this sutra. So the first one is, I am of the nature to grow old. I cannot escape old age. So when I came to Plum Village, I... Um, I was full of um, ignorance <laughs> and arrogance. But when I look at the people around me, especially the elder in the community and, and then Thay, I see something I don't see in my parents. Like when I look at Thay, it's full of acceptance and loving kindness and patient. Oh, my parents have that kind of loving kindness, that kind of acceptance, not fully acceptance, some degree of acceptance. But they don't have that kind of patience that they have. And I live with the other sisters and brothers, and many of them are much older than me. 18 years later, when I come back, they're still around me. And I'm so happy that my elders, they are still there, always be there to support me. And, and their virtues grow with time. Like I said, when I was very, uh, very uh, arrogant of myself, um, regardless, of what I behave, how I behave, they always treat me with kindness and patience. So they give me some space for me to, uh, to grow. Mm. So I, I do feel very lucky to have elders in the community, that they guide me, they support me, Um, before one of the elder sisters left for retreat a week ago, I, um, I told her, um, that I was very regret of what I did or what I said in the past. It took me 10 years to, 
to remember all the unmindful and unskillful actions of the past. Um, and how much the pain I caused. Before she traveled, I, somehow I felt that I have this need to really express myself. Um, because I, I don't have this chance <laughs> for 10 years. So now I have it. And before she traveled, I want her to hear it. Um, so I express it. And, um, and I feel much lighter after I said so. I ordain in the tradition that the person ordain a day before me or even five minutes before me, they are my elder. Even though they are younger than me in age, but they are older in the Dharma. And there's a practice for us to practice, to see them as our elder and to listen to their advice and their guidance. Like I said, when I first came, I have full of opinions and ideas about things, about myself. So in the meetings, I always spoke. <laughs> um, so one of my elder sister, she was younger than me in age at that time, but she ordained before me. Um, she called me out another day. It's not right after the meeting. And uh, she looked at me and she said, there's one thing I'd like to share with you about the meeting. Um, and then I, and I listened, she said, it's very unwise of you to speak like that in the meeting. When I look into her eyes, I don't see any anger or irritation. It's only kindness. And the way she said it, very calm. Of course, I felt, you know, a little bit hurt <laughs> when someone says directly things like that. Yeah. But I, I took her advice and I reflect. Indeed, she spoke the truth. So her piece of advice, it really helped me learn how to listen and not to speak all the time. When I, know, when I learn how to listen, amazingly, I know how to speak. I don't need to speak all the time. So around us, we have a lot of plum trees. Every autumn or every spring, the, the farmers, they need to trim. So trimming these plum trees in order for them to bear more fruits Right? So the sap, the energy of the tree is not branching out everywhere with so many branches and leaves. So they trim it. So they keep the main branches so that they can bear more fruits. So when we are very young in the practice, our energy is sapling everywhere. It goes everywhere. <laughs> because we not yet learn how to discipline ourselves. The thing we like to do, we will do it non-stop. Even time to eat, we don't stop. We, la we work. So we're not able to follow the schedule of the Sangha. So when the elder, they see that our energy is sapling everywhere, they will try to remind us. They will try to trim us a little bit so that we know how to focus our energy in learning, in practicing. I'm very grateful for all the guidance and advices I have on my path. 
even come from my younger sister. Because some of them, 10 years ago, they was in my class. Now when I come back, they are Dharma teacher. And they grow, they really grow. And they're very capable of doing everything. But one thing I see in them, that they grow very beautiful. Just like Thay and the elders, they grow old, but they grow very beautiful. And we used to say when we grow old, we will grow wise. But grow old is also means to grow very beautifully if we embody the teaching and the practices. I had the blessing of being with my mom the last three months, the last nine months before she passed away. So every day I walk with her, eat with her, and I look at her face, and I see many lines. What I see clearest is worries and sadness on her face. Now, her life, she lived a life full of hardship. She had six children to raise. And after the collapse of Saigon in 1975, the economy collapsed also. So she has to work like 14, 15 hours a day to feed us. And it's a lot of worries that we are not safe, that we are, that we are not um, enough, we don't have enough to eat. So every day is a struggle for her. So when I look into her eyes, I see the sadness, and I also see that she lives in the past. Even though she ordained as a Buddhist nun in the very late of her life, in her late 60s, this is something she wishes to do when she was young. But she could not do it when she met my father. She fell for him. So that desire is still alive in her. So uh, much later in life, she, after we grown up, she ordained. And she said, it's so difficult for me to live in the present moment. My mind always go back to the past. And I look at her, I really see it in her eyes. You know, she lived with her past. So this is a teaching for all of us to know that this moment, this day, this time, is a chance for us. When we are young, we have full of things and full of dreams we want to pursue. And we, we tend to postpone. Oh, I can practice later. You know, when I get older, when I'm calmer, when I'm slower, then I can practice. Maybe not now. Now the Sufi uh, dance, uh, another tradition is, is quite appealing. You know, I need to try them all out. So we tend to shop around and we waste our time. So whatever practice we like, we can pick one and invest our time and energy into practicing it. Even though we are very young like this, we are reminded all the time about the practice of mindfulness, come back to the moment, but how much do we remember? Every week we have at least two Dharma talks. We have community practices. But it's so easy for us to slip away and forget. You know, even though we are very young, I'm talking about myself, very young. I forget all the time. So it's not a wonder when my mother gets to her age, 
it's so easy for her to forget and to live in the past. So seeing her is a really a, a motivation for me um, to use my time, my not so full, not so yeah, youth energy, um, but to use it in a way that I can benefit myself and I can um, I can live in harmony with other people. So old age is a very natural process that we all go through. Many of us, we have this fear of getting old. But knowing that growing old, we can grow very beautifully, is very assuring. If we, if we look at Thay, or we look at Sister Chiang Kong, or we look at Sister True Virtue, or some of our elder brothers in our Hamlet, like Brother Pháp Ưng, you see, when they grow old, they grow very beautiful. And their virtues grow at time, with time also. So they are the source of inspiration for us all to look at and to follow. So we don't have to be afraid of our old age. The second remembrance, I am of the nature to get sick. I cannot escape sickness. We all experience sickness from time to time. And look at the way we live our life. we can really see the sicknesses come from where? The Chinese, they say, the sickness comes through the mouth, or whatever we ingest, they go through the mouth and go through the body, infest, and that's how we get sick. But the Buddha said, what we get sick from is from our senses. When we consume with our mindfulness, things get through our senses, and that's how we get sick the way we consume every day. That's how we get the sickness. So when we come here for a whole week, look at us. We don't consume materially, but spiritually, we all gain something. Right? After one week, we feel uh, a bit more relaxed, a bit more at home in our body, a bit more at ease. So we can really see the sickness has really come from our consumption. So to have a week in a monastery like this, collectively we don't consume meat, alcohol, Internet. Tobacco. And that's how the body have a chance to, to heal. So we see it very clearly. Our society has so many depressed people everywhere. Everywhere we go for retreat, we always have people come with depression. 
and many other kinds of mental uh, illness. And the depressed people, they feel very lonely. They don't have this kind of human warmth or human contact very frequent or very regularly. So to have a community like this for people to come and have that sense of connection with all the beings it's very assuring. When you come here for one week you feel the energy of the community. You feel very supported. Or the fact that we don't do any we don't have to do a lot of things. We just follow the schedule. Mm-hmm. To have uh, people around us always offer that kind of support and that presence. That we feel we feel much, much better. When we have retreat in China, there's a man and he lays 60. He came because he's had a very deep depression. And uh, he's on medication for many, many years. So his teacher sent him to our retreat. Uh, so the first few days, he only wanted to go home. It's so difficult for him to be in the temple and to be around people. You know, the, the depression pushing him to run, to go back. But because he lived very far away, we have retreat in Yangzhou and he lived in Guangdong. So it's very far away for him to go back. So he had to stay. And every day, when he show up at the sharing, everybody cheer him up. You know, like, really embrace him and listen to him. So by the end of the retreat, he shared you know, how much he wanted to go home, but he did not go. He said, because I felt that warmth that I don't have it in my family for so long. And in this retreat, it's only for one week. I felt very warm, very connected. Even though I know that my depression is, is still very much the same. It's not go away after one week. But I know that there's people out there that I can reach out and I can have contact and I can be in their companion. That's it's good enough for me. So it's, it's very, um, very inspiring to hear many stories like that in the retreat. And when people, when they come, when they have little expectation of anything, but they find that friendship, they find that um, companionship, so that when they go home, they can continue. So the sickness of our, of our modern time is uh, it's come from really the way we consume and the way we ingest. Today we will not have time to go into this kind of food that we ingest every day. Um, but look, at the, look at, the, at the diet that we have in the monastery. It's purely veg, vegetarian. Strictly, we can say it's a vegan diet because we don't have dairy, we don't have cheese, we don't have... Uh, egg products, dairy products on our menu. And we can really see how wholesome food can heal our body. So we will try our best to, to have organic food. Our shopper does her best to buy organic products for us to consume. And we also have uh, vegetable garden, we also have happy farm, and we try our best to grow our own vegetable so that we can supply it for the Sangha. Eating whole, whole food will give us a chance to heal our sickness. It's not all the sickness that we have to, um, to use uh, medication in order to heal our sickness. But the sickness can come from many different methods of healing. Uh, vegetarian diet, 
meditation, exercise, relaxation, friendship. There's many other elements of healing process for us that we all experience this week. So we hope that you continue uh, to walk on this path to bring whatever you learn from the monastery home and change uh, slowly, slowly your lifestyle, your diet so that you can continue the process of healing. The third remembrance, I am of the nature to die, I cannot escape death. This is something we, we all have to go through. So dying is something that, um, that we can be very fearful of. So last Sunday, we listened to the Dharma talk of Brother Pháp Do you see Thay in him? <laughs> yeah? Do you see Thay in him? And in many other young brothers and sisters? You know, we are all afraid of Thay's death a few years ago. But now look at the Sangha, the way we live, the way we practice, in the way we share the Dharma, you can really see Thay is in us. Thay is in us. Right? If we see Thay is in Brother Pháp Hồ, and we don't really need to fear Thay is death. Physically, right now, he's not with us. But spiritually, he's in every one of us. So if we can see Thay like that, it's not the death is not the ending of Thay. We can we can learn to see it in our parents, in our our relatives, or our children. Many of us, when we come here, we have a lot of grief and sorrow. Grief of the death of our dear ones, and sorrow because of regret. We regret that that person died suddenly, and leave us behind with many regrets. Actually, when we celebrate someone's uh, birthday, we say, uh, happy birthday to that person. We celebrate the life of that person, the time that person manifests and still around with us. But if we look a little bit deeper, we will see that this person the person we are celebrating his or her birthday is, is getting shorter in living. Each day pass is a one day shorter to live. So if we see if we see things like that, we see that person going through the death process slowly day by day. And it helps us to to remember to live deeply, or to treasure the person's presence. For us, the monastic, I, myself, I don't celebrate birthday, but I celebrate ordination day. It makes me feel younger. <laughs> if I celebrate my birthday, definitely it makes me feel <laughs> I'm aging. <laughs> 
but I'm celebrating my ordination age. I feel I'm very young. <laughs> I still have a long way to go. <laughs> but you know, somehow when we look at someone very young, like Brother Pho Ho, when we look at him, we see that he's very young. We may have doubt. <laughs> But the Buddha thought there's four things we should not underestimate. The first thing is a flame. Flame is just a little flame. If we underestimate it, it can burn down the whole forest. Or a serpent. Even though it is very small, but its venom can cure us instantly. Or a young prince. He's very young right now, but he can become a um, king and he has immense power. And lastly, a young pikku even though he's very young, but he has the potential to fully enlighten, to fully awaken. So we should never underestimate these four things. So it will give us many chance to, um, uh, to have pleasant surprise uh, when, when we encounter these four things. When we look at the brothers and the young sisters, Many of them ordained much later, and they have a very different name. Their name begins with sky for the brothers and moon for the sisters. This is something, it's come from the teaching of the Buddha. In the Dhammapada Sutra, the Buddha say the young monks, young bhikkhu and young bhikkhuni, even though they are very young, but if they put all their heart into practice, they can be like, like moon and sun, for the world. They can shine and they can lead the way for people to see the way. So that's how they name young brothers and young sisters, sky and moon. Now you look at them, they are in their early teens, or they're in their late teens, or early 20 or 30. They are very young. Their heart is very pure. They have a lot of joy every day. It is so nourishing to live with them. It's just like you have young children. They are the source of joy for you every day, right? You experience it. It's for us, the young brothers and sisters, they are a source of joy and inspiration for us. I'm so happy when I come back and I see so many young brothers and sisters. They are so fresh and so pure in the way they learn the way they, um, they express themselves. And they have a lot of insights, surprisingly. <laughs> Actually, you should not say surprisingly, you should say amazingly. <laughs> Let's be more correct. So when we, uh, when we look at our parents, and when, when they die, when they pass away, we are so much in pain and so much in sorrow. If we can remember to contemplate and to see what is the most, the most thing that our parents want to do with their life and they did not have a chance to do with their life, if we see that, then we can really see that our parents, they are in us and we can do it. We can do these things for them. Like my mother, she always want, wanted to ordain younger but she never had that chance. And I know she really, really want to be a nun, her next life. This life is really too late for her, but next life she likes to do that. <clears throat> so knowing that, I know that I have a better chance. I can ordain when I was much younger than her. Then I can carry her into the future. So I'm practicing for myself, but I'm also doing it for her. 
So in many ways, I'm not so deeply uh, in grief about her passing away, but each day seeing that I truly continue her. And whatever wish she wants to carry out, and she did not have a chance, I will have that chance to fulfill for her. <clears throat> so if we see that in our parents, then we see their continuation in us and in our children. Of course, our parents, they have their own shortcomings and their own mistakes, the way they treat us or the way they raise us. But we, may, we, we need to look deeply and see they did not have this chance to get to know the Dharma like we do right now. Then it will give us the sense of forgive, forgiving. We can forgive. When we have retreat, not long ago, there's a man, he came up and he asked, my grandmother, she's 94 years old, I want her to apologize to me before she died. Because she made me suffer so much, she had to apologize to me before she died. So we asked him, did you ask her? Yes, I did. And what did she say? He said, she refuses to apologize. She said, I have nothing wrong. I don't have to apologize. So this man, he had this kind of resentment and anger toward her grandmother, his grandmother, and he demanded apology from her. And he suffered from his demand because it's not fulfilled. So he asked, how, how should I practice so I can reconcile myself with my grandma This is the way our brains have been wired. We remember more negativity than positivity. Of course, Grandma did many things to him, not just the mistakes or the wrongdoing. But because of our, our way of wiring our brain for survival, so we remember more the negativity aspect of the person's life. And so then, of course, we have to look deeply. So as you see, all kinds of issues relate to life and relationship. It's all asks us to have the capacity to stop and to look deeply. So whatever we are practicing here for the last week is all helping us to stop, stop our running mind, so we can look deeply and we can heal ourselves mentally, spiritually, and not just physically. So we look deeply, we see that our parents, that our grand grandparents, they did not have the favorable condition we are having right now. That they did not know the Dharma, they didn't know the community, they didn't have any friends on the path to help them. That's how they live their life. We are exactly doing the same if we don't have this chance. We will exactly do exactly what they do. So the capacity to look deeply, the capacity to stop, will help us to look deeply. And that's how it liberates us from our suffering and from our pain. Actually, we are in a much uh, better uh, position than our parents and our grandparents. We have many more chances. We have much better chances than them, than they are in the past. So knowing that to have this, this teaching, this, to have the community, to have friends on our path, it's very assuring that we are not alone.
four remembrances, the four remembrances, uh, all that is dear to me today and those I love will be one day changed and be separated. I think somehow when we live in a place that is um, very favorable in terms of condition, in terms of weather, uh, living conditions, we all tend to take it for granted. But when we live in an environment that is um, that calamity can come unexpectedly or expectedly, like volcanoes. Um, earthquake, and we really, really live with fear. Because things can happen very unexpectedly, and we can lose everything. Like people, when they live in a country with earthquakes, or tsunamis, or a volcano. In one instant, they can lose everything, even their life. So we encounter many people who live with constant fear of this calamity. Actually, it's very fearful to live. Yeah. When you are eating your breakfast, and the earth is shaking, and everything moving around you, it's, it's very fearful. One time I was in Mexico. I was on the third floor. No more sound. Yeah. I was on the third floor, and suddenly the whole building was shaking. I thought the next second I would be falling down straight. And above me is like 10 more floors. It's such a fear that it's like it grips your heart and you cannot breathe. So we all have to run down. And, and, and many minutes, it's still shaking. I remember I was so fearful that I could not breathe. But then once we get out of the building, I regain my breathing. And I realized I can die in that instant. And whatever anger or attachment I have, it is, it's very meaningless to me at that moment. We know that the thing that we possess, the thing that we possess, or the people we live with, one day we will have to be separated. But because our awareness of the, the impermanence is not steady, it's not steady enough. So we um, we forget very easily. It's saying that maybe the talk is quite long, we should stop now. <laughs> Mindfulness will help us to be more aware of our past think of our past uh, action. It will help us to um, reconcile with the people we are living with and treasure their presence. It's just like I did when I uh, came back to Lower Hamlet. 
I realize, you know, the people, especially my elders, it's so precious that they are still around. <clears throat> but it will never be like this forever. In a relatively short time, you know, things will manifest and things will change. So it helped me to treasure that present even more. <clears throat> so the last remembrance, um, our actions, our actions of body, speech, and mind, are our true belonging. They are the stand, they are the ground on which we stand. There's a young girl who walks on the mountain with her mother. <clears throat> and as she walk along the way, she laugh. And then she hear, she hears her laughter. And then she thought somebody's laughing at her. And she say, who are you? And then a second later, she heard, who are you? She walked a few more steps, she asked. I admire you. And then she heard back exactly what she said. I admire you. And then she walked further. She said, you are the champion. <laughs> and the voice said, you are the champion. She was very surprised to hear this kind of voice. So uh, she asked her mother, and her mother told her, that is echo. What we call echo is actually life. What we give out are there, what we give out there in terms of our three actions is exactly what we get back in life. What we give out, we receive back. When I first ordained, I was not mindful. So I'm not very much aware of my speech and my action. It's just like monkey, you know, my mind's like monkey, running all the time. So I did not realize many things I did or said. But, you know, with years, like now when I come back, with living in this setting, in this environment, I remember many things I did, very unskillfully, or very unmindfully in the past. So when things happen to me, I receive back what I give out in terms of thinking, in terms of acting and speaking. You don't think, don't think that the little thing you think or you said is lost. No, it's not. The very little thing, it all come back. I'm sure I made many mistakes. We all made many mistakes because we are not aware of our actions, especially our thinking. When we have negative thinking, we have negative actions and negative speech. That is very, very normal. That is very consequential. That's how, that's how the Buddha taught us the five mindfulness trainings, that they are the guidelines to guide our speech, our, th our thinking, our action. Without this guidance, we continue to make mistakes, and we continue to live in a way that we hurt ourselves and we hurt other people. And so you look at the monastic community, you see we are very diverse. We come from many different backgrounds, and cultures. How can we live together? Of course, we may mistake, <laughs> but we have, we have trainings that help us to be aware of our actions so we can live together. When we are not mindful, we, we hurt people. We hurt ourselves, we hurt people. But when we actually all, when we all practice mindfulness and we live together, Actually, we are enriching each other because there's so much we can learn from each other, from the people who are very different from us. We think that they are very different. But they have, if we look at the different things, 
so easy, so easily to be carried away and to get lost in our perception and our affliction. But if we find a common ground that we all have something in common, that we all can grow together. And when we grow together like that, we're really enriching each other and we become strong. And many of us, when we come here, we find out the five mindfulness trainings. Wow, feels so wonderful. Yeah. And we, uh, we, bring, we bring them home, we practice. And, and it's, it's with more mindfulness, the more we are mindful of ourselves, of the favorable condition we have, the more we want to give back. And what we want to give back is very positive. We don't want to give back the negative thing. So many people, they go back home, they connect themselves to many other people, and they set up groups, uh, sangha, they, so that they can practice together, and they can help many other people. There's a very young couple in China. They are very young, they just marry, and they have a little baby. And as you know, it's not easy to, uh, to practice. Um, I, I, I have to be careful. It's not easy for us to go to China to share the Dharma. <clears throat> so the, but the people, they are very thirsty. They suffer greatly. So those who have a chance to go out, like go to Hong Kong or go to Thailand and, and participate in retreat, and they learn about five mindfulness trainings and mindfulness practice in general, when they go back, they really, really want to help their, their people. So there's this young couple, every month they organize a DOM, exactly like in a monastery. There's only two of them, and the little baby. They organize exactly like a day of nationalness like today. Like 50 people, sometimes 30, sometimes 50 people will come to their house and practice. <clears throat> And they said, by the end of the day, they were exhausted. <laughs> because they work full time. And on Sunday, their resting day, they host it for whole day. But that sense of exhausting evaporated. As, as soon as they see people, when they leave their house, their face change. As they see there's a hope, they see there's a confidence. There's joy in the eyes of these people when they leave the house, go back. So many of us, we go home. This is the way how we want to give back. And I think it's very beautiful if we can give back all the positive aspects of our practice, of the Dharma, of the teaching. <clears throat> So, to the end, I'd like to read to you one saying, one prayer of the Jewish people. I will repeat the second time if the translator cannot get it the first time. <clears throat> May the source of strength who blessed one, May the source of strength who blessed once before us, help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing. May the source of strength who blessed the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing. Thank you.